Hello, welcome to our webinar today on reforming environmental permit and review systems with a case study from El Salvador. My name is Bridget John and I will be your moderator. Today's webinar is hosted by the International Association for Impact Assessment or IAIA. We are the leading global network on best practice in using impact assessment to make informed decisions. Last year, IAIA initiated a webinar program, and I invite you to visit our website and check out uh, some of our past webinars. You'll see a few of the re uh, recent ones on the screen there. We have uh, the most recent one was the proposed Canadian Impact Assessment Act. Um, we have had some on Indigenous peoples and well, uh, psychosocial impact assessment, resettlement, and our upcoming one is on April 10th, and it is accessing and interpreting biodiversity information for high level biodiversity screening. And there will be some information there on IBAT, the Integrated Biodiversity Assessment Tool. So we invite you to um, check that one out as well. Before we get started today, we do have some, some few items of housekeeping to handle first. Uh, we are indeed recording our session today and we will make it available to you afterwards. You'll receive an email with a link in the next day or two. Following Jorge's presentation, there will be time for questions. And so you will see in your dashboard of the webinar, there is a gray pane that says questions. And you can type your questions in that section anytime throughout the webinar. And we will handle those during uh, the question and answer session following Jorge's presentation. Uh, after the Q&A session, we will be having an interactive discussion um, exploring how these reforms might be relevant to your own situations and what other efforts are being made to meet governance and implementation challenges. You can enter your comments and your questions during that session in that same questions panel. The slides for today's webinar will be made available and you will receive a link to those as well, but you can also see them and download them from the handouts pane in your webinar dashboard, as well as a few other handouts that are available and some other documents you might find of interest. Today's webinar is being organized by IAIA's newest special interest section on governance and implementation systems. The co-chairs are Cheryl Wasserman and Heather Smith. They will be facilitating our discussion later today. More information about this section is available in one of the handouts that you can download in the handouts pane. And at this point, I will turn it over to Cheryl Wasserman to get us started. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Bridget. Uh, Heather Smith, my co-chair, and I want to thank the IAIA board for creating the section on governance and implementation and for supporting this, its first inaugural activity. There are four downloadable handouts for participants on the IAIA website, one of which is a summary of the section's goals and plans. Following the presentation, question and discussion sessions, we will be reviewing future activities. Also among the handouts are two published papers summarizing key features of El Salvador's new environmental permit and review system. The reason for highlighting what El Salvador has done will become obvious as we hear our presenter describe the journey and where it has taken them, and we benefit from an actual demonstration of how the system works. Our presenter, Jorge Castaneda, is the manager of the Environmental Assessment Department of the Ministry of Environment and Natural Resources of El Salvador. He started in that position in February 2016 to today, and is involved in helping make the reforms happen. He also knows firsthand what makes the job so difficult. Environmental and social impact assessment rests on the convergence of three great forces. And if we can have the next slide. Thank you, Bridget. First, there's the investor and developer who, for whom the environmental review, unfortunately, is often the last, very last hurdle. Uh, they must jump before work, work can begin, and therefore they exercise enormous pressure on ministries and on the um, uh, 
other institutions that involve uh, such projects and review of such projects. Um, second, so they're wanting speed um, and approval. The, um, the public is concerned about potential harm, lost resources now and in the future, and what interests they want to protect. And also they're concerned about investment. And there's the ministries of environmental uh, protection um, with limited resources trying to avoid and prevent problems to public health and resources that often are constrained in terms of uh, the challenges of intergovernmental relationships, the limitations and laws, uh, resources and staffing, and the related activities they undertake in terms of permits, monitoring, and enforcement to make sure that any commitments made are indeed carried through. Um, so this tension plays out every day in El Salvador and elsewhere around the world. Jorge Castaneda comes to this job with impressive um, credentials. He received a bachelor's degree in civil engineering in El Salvador. He received postgraduate diploma in operational hydrology uh, from the Central University of Venezuela, postgraduate diploma in scientific management at the Higher Institute of Economic and Business Management in El Salvador, advanced diploma of applied environmental management and Northern C Sydney Institute um, in North uh, Southwest um, uh, Wales in, in Australia. And finally, a Master of Science in Water Resources and Hydrology at the University of San Carlos in Guatemala. So he's lived in various countries. He had the perfect credentials for this position. But even with these impressive credentials and degrees, so perfect for managing the environmental assessment function, they would be handicapped without the tools uh, for managing both the people and the paper that can often make the demands of this job so unwieldy and challenging. Jorge, thank you for generously agreeing to take time out of your very busy schedule to share El Salvador's experience in addressing these forces um, and to explore the questions with us of how, why, and what of El Salvador's effort to meet these forces head on. So with that, I am going to turn off my webcam and turn this over to Jorge Castaneda. Thank you, Jorge. A hundred years ago, only two out of ten people live in cities. Today, around half of people on Earth are living in urban areas. And by 2050, in Latin American countries, that proportion will be eight out of ten. So we must live in the planetary boundaries, and our cities need to protect natural environment to preserve the ecosystem services that ultimately sustain our planet. Therefore, as we grow, we have to think about the triple E of global prosperity, which include economy, equity, and ecology. So the holy trinity of sustainable development. But we have been facing some of the global megatrends. And according to the Global Footprint Network, last year, by around the 2nd of August, we have used more from nature than what our planet can reduce in the whole year. So climate change, resources stress, and urbanization are just some of the significant environmental issues in El Salvador. And this is the context in which we undertake these tasks. But uh, before to talk about reforming environmental permit and review system, it's important to understand the context in which we live here in El Salvador. El Salvador is, uh, has a little more than 20, uh, 1,000 square kilometers, and the population is about 6.5 million inhabitants. The majority of people and the productive activities of the country are located into the metropolitan area of San Salvador, which is the capital of the country, but also is one of the most vulnerable countries to climate change, in spite of 
his um, small territorial extension and his high population density, El Salvador maintains a significant level of biodiversity with a good representation of the ecosystem and species and with genetic resources of regional and global importance. In El Salvador, several economic activities critically depend on the biodiversity and the proper functioning of ecosystem, including the agriculture, pr production, fishing, and tourism. Similarly, the economy and well-being of many local communities depend to large scale on the use of biological resources and ecosystem services. And hence, the country biodiversity represents a vital asset for the quality of life and the present and the future for the country's development. However, most of the ecological system face several threats such as reduction, degradation, and uh, fragmentation of habitats, overexploitation of the resources, and pollution. Ecosystem degradation can cause alteration in his structure and the function, reducing supply services, and particularly the capacity of water regulation and increasing the risk of landslide with serious consequence for the society. Similarly, every year in the rainy season, the country receives a significant amount of stormwater that greatly increase river floods and due to the loss of gallery forest, in many cases, it causes overflows and floods, producing enormous social and economic damage. But on the other hand, in the rural areas of the country, the population depends directly on the goods and services of ecosystem. So biodiversity lost associated with environmental degradation becomes one of the greatest threats to quality of life, food security, and health for local population. And to top it off, post-war and low economic growth has been causing migration to other countries. This is just the sherry at top of the cake. What is the near future for us? Well, this is the image then you can see the, what was the development of the country by 1980. And the next slide, you can see what's the difference in about just 30 years for the next slide in 2016. So according to the planning of Metropolitan areas in Salvador by the year 2030. In the next slide, you can see how we're going to have uh, around 28,000 families. And annually, this group, this group of people will generate around a 111,000 uh, solid waste, as well as they're going to consume around 11,900 uh, cubic meters of drinking water. And, and for this, we face this challenge. So we have to thought to radically transform these assets to uh, using the environmental assessment system to turn the challenge into opportunity, seeking the environmental impact assessment becomes a valuable tool to achieve sustainable development. So first of all, we have to think about the diagnosis or the assessment of the situation. We use information from CNET, which is the database in which store the activities of environmental assessment process, as well as, the, as, well as we undertake interview with personnel uh, of the environmental assessment department and external consultation. It is important to know that the process of environment assessment in El Salvador is a dynamic is in both ways, the applicants for the one side, but on the other hand, the Ministry of Environment and Natural Resources. So after we undertook this task, we have very a particular and important finding that uh, we can show you in the next slide. So the finding were in both ways for Marn, the main finding were that we don't have a systematic record for all the process. And we got a lack of uh, standardization of the environmental assessment criteria. And the most important thing was the long time to provide answer. 
but from applicant or the public in general, we found that uh, systematic requests for modification of, to the environment permit already issued, and the ratio was two to one. So that means for each impact study register, there were at least two requests to modify or change the permit that we have already issued. So the other important thing was uh, we found that the long-term response period to the observation may but mark. So the relationship, it was, as well as the first time, the double. And another particular thing was the systematic requests for time extension in order to submit document to respond to MAR observation. In some time, up to seven extension had been registered to submit document to MAR. And finally, the systematic request for meeting to clarify observation issued by MAR. Sometime, at least last year, were more than 600 annual meetings. Let's see what uh, were the strategy to approach to try to reform and uh, provide certainty, transparency, accountability, validation, and in particular, special information and access to the participant for the all level of impact. So the key strategic step uh, were, first of all, uh, the stakeholder engagement and we decide to put focus on one group for the stakeholder engagement uh, we're taking into account that the construction sector pretend to invest a lot of money for the next three years so that's why we decide to a, um, use this sector for undertake the first step uh, then was the simplified administrative uh, requirements as well as to change the categorization criteria and the screening process and standardize the uh, term of reference for environmental studies. And one of the most powerful tools we have now is the online platform. And Finally, the reform proposal that we uh, that uh, at the moment we still waiting for approval. So the stakeholder engage engagement. For a stakeholder engagement, as I say, as I said before, we undertake the task for using the construction sector, and we found that in Salvadorian Builder Association called Casalco one of the most important as well as the ministry uh this ministry of housing and urban development planning office of the san salvador metropolitan area and municipally planning office as well as the national administration of accredited sewer system in our country so we start to have meeting with them and we uh, have a lot of feedback that we use to undertake this, undertook this task. In the next slide, uh, we um, after after the meeting and the workshop, we passed some satisfaction survey using the Survey Monkey, which is a very useful tool. And they say we would like to thanks to Minister and the technical team for opening this space and the quality of the workshop they say that uh, there were 50% excellent and 50% very good. So they, they really understand that we want to um, improve our system. And they say, OK, the rules are very, very clear. Given that we got to part of the environmental assessment process in El Salvador, so we decide to put more attention in the first part, which is the screening process. So we simplify the administrative requirements. Before we got around 14 requirements before to start the assessment of criteria. Now we simplify and 
Yeah, we uh, require just one of them. And the screening criteria process. Previously, all the criteria of categorization were a, all were critical, but now, but now, thanks to the new categorization, which is based on weighted categories, categorized that depend on the scope and sensitivity of the environment for every project, there were three main categories with our list uh, has a medium impact criterion, high impact criterion, and critical impact criterion. So we make a change, and uh, at the end of the presentation, I'm going to show you the result of that changes. So let's go to the next slide. This is the um, the official document that shows that we make a change and the categorization was issued in the last August. Then the next slide. We can standardize the term of the reference in order to submit an environmental studies before we got five but now in the next slide we can show that uh, we got just one and this is a uh, standardized and it's general and we got uh, plus technical guidelines then application form before we got a lot of confusion and the people really don't really they really don't understand well the process because we got at least uh, 25 application form. But now we decide to use just one and it's online, which is uh, through the online platform. And this is the online platform. And uh, I'm gonna show you how it works. And let's next slide. Uh, we launched that system uh, last year. And it's very simple. That is a um, systematic system with around 138 queries, which is provide the information to assess the, um, the proposal process. But in the first stage, so that means we don't have a lot of information we just need the uh, particular and um, significant information for every project before to start the assessment in more detail. Next slide. We can see in the next slide, uh, for example, we use a geographical information system based on BHEA, and this is thanks to the EPA from the United States. So um, we use a lot of um, geographical information system, for example, the Water Exploration Index. And we took this for the official document for El Salvador. In the next slide, we can see a um, environmental zoning around and into the um, San Salvador metropolitan area because there are a particular environmental asset that we need to protect in order to avoid uh, damage for the population. So we use the environmental zoning and the new system, as well as two-dimensional hydraulic modeling for floods and landslide and debris flows and volcano hazards and all sort of things. We got an uh, information as well from the LIDAR. We can see in the next slide, next to slide, the LIDAR. And the resolution of this information is just one meter. So we got a very good resolution for the information. We starting to uh, change the maps transforming and the more uh, specific and uh, best uh, resolution scale for the decision making process. And finally, the reform proposal. So for this, uh, we found the amendment to environmental permit and we decide to uh, propose 
two kind of amendment. One of these is the significant, which um, we're gonna start to uh, ask for more information. And, but the other one is uh, no, no significant. And for this, our, our proposal is, uh, we suggest that permit without a consent, just uh, send a letter to our ministry and say, uh, we're gonna, we're gonna uh, undertake uh, small changes in the, in the environmental permit and that would be okay. And for extension, establishment of timelines. Another important thing is the a um, certification for service provider, which will be undertaken by diploma courses and performance evaluation, and as well as the call of professional ethics. Okay, the result. For this uh, seven uh, months, we compare the old system with the new one. And we use around these um, four criteria. The period under review was the same period, which means seven months for both of them. Uh, we use the construction sector to undertake this evaluation. And only the complete evaluation and in the screening process. And as you can see there, yeah, in the next slide, uh, you can see the, with the old process compared to the new one, in the new one, we increase at least 20% of the number of uh, application complete, which is uh, really good for the this very first, a stage of the new system. And, but uh, the most important thing here um, is that in terms of the, in term of the reference for environmental study, we got uh, now around an increase in 108%. In terms of the timing, timing time for response, we decrease in one of the categorization, which is which is uh, N2 for uh, low impact, a uh, reduction in timing for 35%. But the most significant was and the uh, issue the term of the reference and we got more than 80% of reduction of the time. What about the enforcement? For enforcement, um, last year, led by Mar in June 2017, 400 volunteers know to be part of the local environmental observer network, which is a very important because those people are um, as a volunteer, they can talk to us and say what happened into the small and local areas. And the launch of uh, annual operation report platform, which is now available and it's online, and the next step will be to um, um, use the platform and join, and they just a uh, very unique one. Let's go to the next slide. This is how the platform is uh, now available online, as well as our environmental assessment platform. And um, what will be the next step? Next step will be the system integration, which means the compliance and uh, assessment system will be and the, just an integration of the system. And given that uh, for the first for the first stage, stage, we use a construction sector, 
we're gonna assess um, for the next uh, three or four months the industry and the energy sector. And uh, we have a lot of work to do. That's why we have to improve the tracking dashboard. And this is all the in small step um, what we do to try to you know, improve and reform the online platform that um, we're pretty sure that certainty, provide certainty, transparency, and accountability and validation for uh, our country. Thanks, Reed. Excellent. Thank you so much, Jorge. That was a great presentation. Uh, we'll now go ahead and handle some questions that were tossed out our way. Uh, first, uh, Jorge, what uh, Juan wants to know, what were the main challenges to undertake the improvement process? The improvement process was to search in the database because it was uh, quite difficult because all the process they done a standardized and systematic recording in the system. So it was uh, very challenging to start to uh, search information, as well as the stakeholder engagement, because um, here in El Salvador, we got a particular problem. Uh, I mean, because the approaches for the sustainable development from the construction sector and for environmental sector is, um, is quite different. So we try to convince the people, and um, I mean, both of them, the systematic information system and the database research, and to start to engage the people from the in, uh, construction sector was the main challenge. Okay. Maria is asking, what are the scale, accuracy, and resolutions of the maps that the system uses? Yeah, for some of them is um, an incredible one meter resolution, but not for all of them. Uh, for the other one, and sometimes is um, twenty five thousand meter resolution. So we start to uh, re um, recalculation for all of them in order to use the more. Um, uh, the more detailed one. Okay. Uh, Mark is asking, what about data accuracy and uncertainty? Yeah, this is a very good question. Um, I mean, we undertook at least two audits, and we found um, still found founding some problem. So the accuracy is. Uh, at uh, this level is very good, but uh, has every new system, you have to be aware that uh, some issues could be, yes, be, yes, in the corner. So at the moment, it's still very good. The audit um, was a very important tool to uh, avoid and reduce the uncertainty in the process. Okay, uh, George is asking um, how, how, what has been the responses of the permit applicants? Pardon me? What, uh, what, how has been, what has been the response of the permit applicants? Uh, yeah, uh, I mean, I receive a lot of uh, emails and um, a lot of phone calls. Some people are very happy with the system. And other ones are still uh, are still not so happy at all because as new one uh, we have to uh, socialize and have more workshops. That is um, this is the plan for this year. Okay, and we have time for one last question before we get into our discussion portion with Cheryl and Heather. And this one comes from Amanda. What is the level of acceptance among the population? I don't have the, the facts 
here at the moment because I am still working on that. But it's about 70% uh, of the people that use the system are, are, are very happy with the new system. Great. That's fantastic. Yeah. All right. Well, Jorge, thank you so much. Um, we will go ahead and um, bring Cheryl and Heather online and so they can start sharing their webcams and unmuting their microphones and I will turn it over to them. Okay, thank you very much, Bridget, and thanks for the opportunity. Thanks, Jorge. Thank Cheryl you. and Heather, over to you. Um, hi, before we get into um, um, the discussion issues, I, I just want to take this opportunity, since I have the mic, to bring out a couple of, of uh, points about El Salvador's system and in the meantime answer some relevant questions that I see have been asked. Um, the first is that um, geographic information systems are being used throughout the process by project proponents and others. What's unique is that first, the NEPA assist uh, tool that US Environmental Protection Agency funded by USAID gave to countries in Central America and elsewhere, does an analysis of the information with prescribed questions and then they can be changed on the fly. So it's a screening tool. And what El Salvador did for the first time, they asked for an online permit application and there was an, a connection, then it autofills some of the requests for information on the permit application. The last questioner asked about the accuracy and quality of the information, and that was an impediment to the ministry accepting the use of this system. And as everyone knows about information, if you don't use it, it doesn't improve. So the project proponent has that autofill capability, but they are responsible for the accuracy. And because this is public, the public can also weigh in if the information is not accurate. So that was the first step. El Salvador wanted to autofill the application. Then it turned out that there were 27 applications and there were differences and so forth. So it required a rationalization of that. But because the information was so detailed and the categorization criteria did not match up with the application information and it had different categories. El Salvador said, oh, well, we want to automate categorization, which meant you had to go back and make sure that the information on the applications would give you sufficient information to categorize projects. So that's the first thing I wanted to mention about this system. The other was that the industry and the, and the ministry were talking past each other about the problem of delay. And this gets back to what any reform effort has to do, which is to look in detail at how it really works and what the relationships are. So what happened is the construction industry was the most vocal complaining about the process. But the ministry staff, who were very diligent and had a tracking system, it showed that they were not taking up much time. They would complete their work, and then the ball would go to the construction sector. When we looked at in detail at the process, it turns out that there were steps where MARN had to get validation from other ministries, and that was a delay. Some of that is now automated in the new platform. There was also a waiting period of going back and forth with MARN giving their evaluation of information that was missing. And that request would sit at the ministry waiting to be picked up by the project proponent. Now all of that is, all those communications are handled. Jorge, correct me if I'm wrong. 
but all of those communications are handled online and public. And so, and because there's clarity in the request for information and the fact that it's an online, online application, the fact that it's incomplete can be known right away to the proponent before it's even submitted. So those are the kinds of things I um, wanted to mention. And finally, um, it turned out that the only, there was a question here about environmental management plans. There are three levels. The middle and high level were required to submit an environmental management plan for mitigation. But the middle level tier, because they did not require an environmental impact assessment, had no permit. So there was nothing enforceable afterward. There was no accountability for the information they submitted. Now, by permitting everyone, it creates an integrity to the whole process, even though lower government levels are responsible for low impact sources. So this provides a capability even for the local levels of government by having a system with one application coming in with the information, accuracy accountable to the developer with follow-up. If they say they're not going to cut down uh, mangroves, even for the smallest facility, they have in a permit they have their pro, um, their information, and there's more integrity to the process and more environmental control. So on the one side, the developers have gotten more certainty and timeliness, but on the other side, there's far more accountability and environmental control nationwide. So um, I, I just wanted to bring out um, those points. So I think that answers um, is Wilson uh, Mehuo's uh, question about whether there's an environmental management plan. And for the first time, those plans or the, the, the um, information provided by the proponents are all enforceable. Um, Heather, do you want me to do the next question with Sharice Braithwaite? And I'd like Jorge maybe to say anything. How is the ministry able to secure the buy-in for such a commitment of time and resources needed for the improvement process? Jorge, you can, um, there were two ministers. The first minister, Minister uh, Chavez, uh, was very interested in reforming the whole process. He was under tremendous pressure and complaints about the process. So he convinced USAID to fund reform effort. Because of the delays in funding and so forth, it got started at the close of his term and the beginning of Minister Lena Paul's. Minister Paul did a high wire act. She promised the president that she was going to undertake these reforms in very short order. And at the beginning of the effort, she had a very public presentation on certain introductory elements involving not only the president, but all the other ministers sitting there and watching this, what was possible. And she wanted 80% of the inquiries and permits and assessment workload to go down to the local level and wanted an automatic permit for the low impact facilities. So she demonstrated what this would look like. I think that was important. The other thing was time and the fact that through a series of three different project managers, uh, Selena Monterosa had come from a position in the ministry which dealt with the public um, 
and um, she knew how to run a public outreach effort in both the NGOs and the public and industry. Uh, Jorge, did you want to add anything to that? Oh, sure. Um, the story is perfect. So, I mean, this uh, just what happened before. Yeah, the two minister uh, has a particular view on approaches, and that's why we already use the system. So you, um, you're you right. Now, I would say that, uh, hi, Heather, I'm, I'm sorry, maybe, Maybe, Heather, you have some time constraints? Uh, no, I was just going to ask the next uh, question in the in the line of questioning. OK, if I could just respond sure. to the, the level of support that this got. They had to take, it was interesting because the most pressure was on the environmental impact assessment group. But a lot of the work did not, was, did not involve that group. And they call, they set up a separate team to work on the platform and reach out to industry while the environmental impact assessment group could continue to work on the important, on the um, high impact projects. So that was important. And again, that needed the, the support of the minister who was again, walking a high wire act, but the pressures were enormous on them for investment and changing the way they did business. So I turn to Heather. Thanks, Cheryl. Um, so another question from Hapta Jebetha Debella is, is there any standard software uh, to um, contextualize or use uh, for other countries? Or did you develop software unique for um, El Salvador? Yeah, we use a particular um uh, yes uh, we got a particular software for simulation but this is just uh, using the formation in detail to fit the web web-based platform but it's not a particular software for the platform itself which is uh is in a, a web-based and uh using the in geographical information system I, I think that this platform in a flexible way can be deployed in other countries and in other settings. And it's my post-retirement um, uh, desire to see some sort of concerted effort with a combination of funding from the different development banks to see if we can come up with something that's that standardized that then each country can adapt for its own use and um so uh, we can talk about that further on offline but i think that's that's a worthy goal because the platform itself is extremely valuable and any country can put in their own categorization criteria um, the questions that are asked, but I think that El Salvador's detailed questions are an excellent starting point. Um, the communication uh, platform tracking, the all the relationships tracking, I think it's a platform that um, the people who developed it, uh, Ambiente, uh, can be used internationally. I'm sorry, Heather, next question. Well, I just wanted to um, follow up on that on that question. So, was the software is it open source or is it commercially available? The um, NEPA assist part of it, the VHR part of it, um, is an application using off the shelf Esri software. Um, but it, so it's an application. The rest of it is not open source, at least at this point. If I'm using the right terminology. Great, so um, uh, thanks for, um, for clarifying that. Now, there's another question that I think will get at a whole uh, bunch of issues, um, and it comes from Alicia Lawrence Wing, 
Um, the question is, in Trinidad, uh, we're trying to improve the application form and developing sector-specific application forms, going from one form to many, uh, which is the reverse of what uh, was done in El Salvador. Um, and she wants to know how uh, do folks who are not computer literate apply and go through the process? So have you had any web accessibility problems um, in, in implementing this process? Uh, by the way, Heather, can you put on your webcam so we can see you as well as me? There you go. Jorge, do you want to answer that? And I have to, two cents to add to it. You can unmute yourself. Uh, yes, Cheryl. Well, we found uh, some uh, small problem during the application form, but I'm pretty sure that if you set your goals in very particular detail and put as a, uh, as a special to do, I'm pretty sure that in the Trinidad Tobago they can um, they can develop. Um, a very good uh, system for uh, the requirement. If I might, um, the system is set up almost like an expert system. So if you answer one set of questions, you quickly limit the number of questions you're asking. El Salvador, I like to say that whoever set up their application system to begin with was anal. In other words, it was so elaborated and so elaborate, it was a very good place to start for anything like this. If, if a country started with just some open-ended questions, they could not have done what El Salvador did. So in launching this, there was a teaser by the minister who was so amazing up there in front of 300 people. They also had um, uh, um, kiosks set up in uh, decentralized around the country in the various municipalities, the key ones, where people could get help filling out the, the application online. But previously, farmers, others would come to San Salvador to their window to ask questions and that was burdensome so this way there were knowledgeable people in the field who could help the people complete the application online the other thing is with the app with the information the environmental and social information right there and accessible to them and auto filling the application it could give investors a sense of what the risks are going into it. The investors bear responsibility for the delay if they propose investments that are questionably in the national parks, in flood areas, in high risk areas for volcanic activity, for seismic activity. This puts the onus on the developer also to consider that information in advance. So I think that uh, I would urge Trinidad and Tobago to actually go online to, to MARN, uh, which they can do, to get one of those applications and see, but it works now like an ac expert system. So that if there was a separate application before for ranching and there was a separate ap application for whether you had meat processing on that plant now it asks the question are you agriculture are you ranching what what the size and scope of the ranch is and whether you do meat processing so that automatically takes you to other relevant questions that then can can handle uh, that in they know whether it's categorized as needing an environmental impact assessment, whether there are still open questions, what analysis might be needed 
for that particular situation. I, I'm sorry that Jorge was not able to show this to you online as a demonstration because it has very detailed information in it that provides both parties what they need and less detail when it's a very simple matter. Heather? So another question that kind of drives at how it was um, accomplished is uh, from Alicia Lawrence Wing. Uh, and um, she notes that uh, the presentation says the administrative requirements were simplified from uh, 14 to one. So can you talk a little bit about how that was achieved? I think maybe some of it um, relates to your comment that uh, there was a lot of information required in, under the old process. So um, maybe we'll start with Jorge. Yeah, thanks, uh, Heather. Okay, we decided to make that they made that change because uh, sometimes after you receive all those those uh, fourteen a um, fourteen documents, after that when you undertook the screening, you realize that you don't need that information because it's no significant impact to the environment. So that's why we decide to okay before you go in a further assessment and um, environmental further assessment. So we uh, decide for the first stage in the screening process and the very first stage to uh, use our online information and just a, just a some question for the public and general public and the applicants in order to decide if this uh, this particular project is going to have a significant or no significant impact on our environment. That's why I decide to uh, require those documents in the next stage, but not by the very first one. If I could add to that, um, the original application forms had several sections. The first section was about the legal status and information about the project proponent. Now El Salvador has a separate process where an applicant or proponent, whether they have a project in place or not, can register. And part of that process was validating the information, the legal entity information, and that involved another ministry. So that is now done automatically online and in a separate and a registration and that's not part of the application second they decided to divide the application the application itself almost required an environmental impact assessment to fill it out because it asked for impacts information and details in different phases construction um, site preparation construction operation and closure by separating that out they were able to winnow down the information required and it was very clear then what supplemental studies were needed finally sometimes you can do a supplemental study without having to do an entire environmental impact assessment if it's a narrow issue so this enabled the whole process to cascade and and um spit out, if you will, uh, actions before the entire process had to be completed. On the other hand, if it was known that environmental impact assessment was needed, they didn't have to go through all the steps in between. They could go right to what were the terms of reference and what was required for environmental impact assessment. And finally, for the terms of reference, El Salvador operated like almost a development bank where they had to develop a terms of reference individually for each project. And that took a lot of time when in fact it could be tailored through a scoping process rather than start out with all that burden on the ministry. Uh, thanks, Cheryl. Um, so a little follow-up question to that, because um, 
I, I, I think we're getting at a lot of issues here, is um, uh, what the level of um, public um, involvement and access to information is through this online system. Um, are there other uh, tools that are used to um, make people aware of um, applications? And um, what's the, or a related question to that would be, if you do uh, scope to a specific issue or narrow down the range of things that are focused in on, is that a technical decision? And what role do uh, public concerns play in focusing the, the assessment? Jorge, you want to speak first, <laughs> please? Why don't you unmute? Uh, why don't you show your webcam so you can join us if you want? Okay. Uh, thanks, um, Cheryl. Yeah, I'm gonna try to respond the first part. Okay. Um, this is the public access, and it's free. I just gonna say that I receive um, uh, information on. Sunday around 11 p.m. I mean, uh, every people around the country can use the online platform every day, everywhere. I mean, it's, it's, it's public. Yeah. Uh, for the second one, it's very important to show the people what is the new system and how it work. And this is a very, that's why that uh, question was was, was, was very good. I mean, we develop a tutorial that we want to post online for the next, I mean, in the next three weeks is going to be available online to show in the very easy way how the system is work. If I may, one problem that I've seen all around the world is that the public gets involved very late in the process, even though they're supposed to be scoping. Uh, usually that's carried out by uh, the project proponent through the consultant. And in, in, in El Salvador and other countries around Central America, Latin America, Asia, and so forth, the public gets a draft or a final environmental impact assessment, and there's very little time to comment. And it's also very late to influence the project or decision making. By having this application public, it buys a lot of additional time for the public to decide, do I want to be involved in this? Um, they can arrange to be notified of any projects planned within their um, municipality or region. Um, they can even it can uh, the platform can arrange to notify certain people in, so, in a certain sectors. So by getting engaged early on, by enabling them to look out for scoping opportunities for meeting with the project proponent and the consultants, it really advances the cause of meaningful public participation, as well as the transparency of what's happening in the ministries. Often the public never saw the value added of the ministry's review and back and forth with a project proponent asking for more information. When they don't see that, they have no idea how it's improved the information and, 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 and who should be accountable for what. So uh, just a follow-up question on the notification. Um, are they getting that via email or via a text message? Yeah, the notification, the notification is by email. It's by email, the notification of the process. And uh, this is a platform in which uh, the web page, uh, we submit the final document and uh, the very first stage, which is during the public consultation, we also post the information through our, our web page. The, the platform that Jorge has mentioned also helps internal communications within the ministry. There's a draft a version control. There's who has it. There's what the comments have been. 
Uh, there's access to all the documentation. It really does save time when you don't have to have large documents and separate studies and so forth go from one office to another. Great. Um, so thank you. Now, another follow-up question that's just come in from uh, Donna Hofskian is around um, the role of consultation with Indigenous people in the environmental uh, permitting process. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, um, the situation in El Salvador is uh, very, very, very unique because the Indigenous Indigenous people here in El Salvador is just located in a very, very small and located area, which is uh, actually near my house. Um, that's why some of the projects in that particular area, um, we decide to um, ask the people before to undertook the project and some of the small um, small uh, hydrological um, power station are not permitted in that area. But it's because the indigenous people in our country is just a few percent of the population in is located in very, very small, small area. Um, obviously, anything that helps public participation to begin with, including starting from an initial application, is going to help with the consultations with the indigenous peoples. But I, I wanted to take this opportunity, uh, Heather, I don't know if you were going to ask this question, Delia uh, Gorgas, I hope you pronounced your name. It says, where where there are training activities carried out for the staff and for how long and how are they getting along with the new system? I will tell you that there was a lot of internal controversy about introducing a new system when the staff thought that the existing system was fine until they realized it wasn't. Um, there were issues that any new platform has to face in transferring the old information into the new platform because enforcement needs the old information access to old environmental impact assessments and so forth that they really needed and had trouble getting in the first place but there was migration i think is the word um jorge can you say something more about the migration from the old system to the new and it definitely took more time than the than the minister in 2014, when she described all this, would happen within months. It's taken more time. But I think everybody realized they needed more time for buy-in and for a smooth implementation. Jorge, you want to add to that? Yes, uh, thanks, Cheryl. So that's why I decided to still using the old system and the new one because some of the process is still is still assessing in the all all system so but over time the new system it will be the unique one but at the moment we still using both and we decide to given that it's uh, it's gonna take uh, a lot of effort and uh, a lot of work to take the information from from the older one to put in the new one we decide to still use uh, both of them. It's much more easier for us. How has the staff adapted to the new system? What I mean, Shira? Do they like it? Have they come to love it <laughs> after being skeptical? Or were they so involved that they felt that they bought into and it had an impact on the design? I mean, as as always in life, for the new stuff, the people don't want to, I mean, get involved easily. Uh, even the, the technical team in uh, the Department of Environmental Assessment in the ministry. But now, uh, given that the workshop and given that they show the result and the benefits of the new system, 
our technical team and the people outside of the minister uh, start to um, be realizing that there are a lot of uh, advantage to use the new system. But it takes time and a lot of effort to bring everybody on board, doesn't it? Yeah, that's right. That's right. This is my, and this is part of my job. <laughs> Um, we're almost out of time, so uh, there's, there are more questions than time available. I'm going to ask another question from Delia around uh, compliance. What metrics are you using to assess compliance? Um, Cheryl, do you have uh, anything to um, uh, add on that question? I am sorry, I phased out because there was a very, there are several other very good questions that we haven't asked. So what was that question? Or I'd well, like to answer. Yeah, the question is around uh, what metrics are used for assessing compliance with the permit. I, I'm going to add something here. When I worked with closely with El Salvador on this process, a concern about Compliance and enforcement was the primary concern of Minister One. And it turned out that um, the whole system, the law and everything was not focused on compliance, but rather on damages and release of a, of a, of a guarantee that was given by the project proponent at the point they're ready to start operation. So there was very little handle on compliance with terms of a management system. And that's part of the legal reforms that they're undertaking. And um, with the um, online environmental management plan, it's, it's much, and, and the, I don't know whether that's operational, but what we recommended was that it be clear what institution was responsible for follow-up monitoring because as you know when you require an environmental impact assessment you uh, have often uh, requirements or management commitments that go beyond the uh, authority of of the ministry um, so I, I think for a lot of these we can be following up later on the enforcement angle when you hear about what we're doing um, in far as enforcement. I, I, Raquel uh, Soto asked a question about certification of the service provider. Um, was it also part of the reforms? Uh, what about the experience with the issue? How do you evaluate performance? And she mentions that in Peru, they have a registry of specialized companies who develop the environmental impact assessment or record information, but they have problems with the information. So I will tell you from the DR forum that was held and we'll be posting that information, there's no secret magic bullet to getting a quality environmental impact assessments. You need not only registries, but training and accountability and uh, Panama has a system of posting the quality and quality problems and evaluating the, uh, the registrants and, and denying them uh, future work if the, um, their performance is very bad. So that is, a, is an issue facing everyone. Jorge, do you want to mention something? Has this system led to increased quality that you've seen in environmental impact assessments? Yes, definitely, because uh, we're going to use all the information provided for applicants to feed our database in order to improve our um, simulation. So that's why over the time, we're going to use that information in order to um, improve our environmental impact assessment system as well as the compliance system because the new compliance system is online and our purpose at least for this year is to mix up both and uh, one and the very only one integrated system 
So that means we're going to use part of the plan <laughs> so that they're not separate functions. It's a whole continuum. Unfortunately, we're running out of time, as you mentioned, Heather. Um, maybe if I'm very quick with the next piece of oh. information. Yeah, what I was going to suggest, there are a few questions that we haven't got time to answer, and they're around the timing and the phases of implementation. So maybe we can um, follow up to participants and provide them with answers to those questions around timing and transition from the old system to new. And then do you want to move on to talk about um, the other information around the session and other related um, webinars? Jorge, are you willing to uh, spend some more time with us answering the questions? Yeah, of course, of course, Thanks. definitely. You've you've engendered a lot of interest. So if we could go to the next two uh, next two slides. Okay, so um, I first want to say that we have. Um, uh, the, one of the attachments, uh, the, one of the downloadable documents is a description of this new section. And we're trying to look at the, stepping back and looking at the whole process of managing environmental impact assessment through to enforcement from before application through. So this is the first, and the International Network for Environmental Compliance and Enforcement, INES, has is introducing a webinar series on enforcement and environmental impact assessment and the first of those uh, webinars will be held uh, April 17th and you can see here you'll see on your slides that you can also download information on how to register for that and I'm hoping that we'll also have a chance to talk about some of El Salvador's experience with that then. And then you can see there are three other webinars planned. Um, so I encourage you as part of our um, uh, inter-institutional uh, collaboration, this is relevant to governance and implementation. Um, also, we'll have two sessions at the Durban um, uh, IAIA conference in May. Um, one will feature El Salvador's experience, the World Bank, and uh, Canada's experience, thanks to Heather, on their recent reforms. And another will be a first section meeting of, um, of governance and implementation. Um, any feedback we get from you will be very useful how we proceed going forward. So um, with that, I turn to um, Bridget on housekeeping matters. If I haven't forgotten anything, Heather? <laughs> no, I don't think so. Um, just thank you to all the participants, both uh, to Jorge for the presentation, which was really interesting, and uh, lots of excellent questions that really get to uh, the heart of understanding how the system works. So thank you to all. Absolutely. Thank you, Jorge, for your time and your presentation. And to all three of you, to Heather, to Cheryl, and Jorge, for a great follow-up discussion. Uh, very engaging, and I hope everyone appreciated it. I certainly did. Um, just want to let you know that, again, remind you that you will receive a link in the next day or two to the recording. Um, you can download the slides from this webinar uh, dashboard, but we will also make those available at the same place that you can listen to the recording. So if you missed those, you have a second chance. When you exit this webinar, I encourage you to complete the brief survey that we have for you, um, both to uh, get, give us feedback on the webinar as a whole, but also some specific information related to the content of this webinar. So please take a few moments to do that. And uh, again, final thank you to everyone. We know that your time is valuable. We hope this webinar was valuable to you. See you next time.